Biblical Textual Studies, an introduction to King James Onlyism and textual criticism. I worked on some material months ago to talk about King James Onlyism and good Bibles versus bad Bibles and all of that stuff, and it kind of fell by the wayside, so I've been trying to push myself to get some content done on this subject. People occasionally ask me about this every now and then. Somebody once begged me to actually cover this topic, but I haven't found time in the past. Um, so I'm going to start working on some material, hopefully, in this series as the months progress. And it does deviate from the typical stuff that I normally talk about, because I normally focus on salvation issues and so forth. But there is some crossover with this series and some of the salvation issues, like uh, the repentance issue. And obviously, there is a whole Bible. We do need to move on to some other subjects as well. Now, the scholars and the scoffers of our day may look at the title and think that King James Onlyism and textual criticism put together is a contradiction in terms, because textual critics as a whole, they reject the King James Only position. And so to be King James Only, you really have to reject a lot of aspects of textual criticism. I do understand that. But this series is broader than that. It's not focused on one or the other at exclusion. It won't just be about King James Onlyism. We'll consider the history of the Bible, the Bible in other languages, and this, that, and the other. So it's more of a general series, really, about Bible translation and scriptural preservation and so forth. Not all of it is going to be about doctrines from the scripture. Some of this series will be more of a history lesson or just something informative because that's the nature of the topic. So what is this all about? Well, regular viewers of this channel know that I exclusively use the King James Bible for quoting verses and pointing to what the Bible says to justify what I believe. If I do refer to other translations, it's usually to criticise or denounce them, though on the rare occasion I will refer to other translations if the subject matter warrants that I talk about differences between translations. This raises many questions, such as what about people who don't speak English as a first language? What did we have before the King James Bible? Why not use a more modern translation that is more appropriate in contemporary English? Why is it necessary to have so many Bible translations? Why do various translations have completely different readings or even completely different verses? Now, just as a disclaimer, I am not a qualified textual critic. I am not even a student of textual criticism. This series does not replace or displace or substitute professional textual criticism for students who are serious about the topic. It's more appropriate for people who don't wish to get too deep into it, but just need some basic help in understanding some of the issues related to this. So it's kind of a crash course, really. So what exactly is King James Onlyism? Well, there are different variations of this, but broadly speaking, it is a position whereby English-speaking Christians, such as myself, exclusively or preferentially use the King James Bible, usually the 1769 edition, to establish matters of doctrine, such as soteriology, that is how to be saved, or theology, which is the study of God, or eschatology, the study of end times, etc. It has different variations which can be described like so. So, for example, there's the kind of favouritism position, I suppose, that I like the King James Version the most, so somebody may not be adamantly against other translations, but will use the King James Version because it's their favourite or they're most familiar with it. And then there's translational, so this is where people will say that the King James Version is the most accurate, so it is considered to be the best translation of the underlying Hebrew and Greek, though other translations may be acceptable. In non-English languages, this does not apply to King James Onlyism, but the same debate may happen with their available translations. And then there's the manuscriptural side, which is Textus Receptus Onlyism, and this is the position that the King James Bible uses the most accurate or authoritative manuscripts, the received text. Textual critics and scholars reject this premise, saying that the KJV uses inferior manuscripts. In non-English languages, accurate Bibles are acceptable if they are also translated from the received text. So, for example, in Spanish, the equivalent would be the Reina Valera onlyism position. And then you have what tends to be more Ruckmanite type of positions, and this is the inspirational or revelational positions, that the King James Bible is re-inspired. So the inspirational view says that the King James Bible has been re-inspired and may even take precedence over the Hebrew and the Greek. And then the revelational view puts this on steroids, essentially, saying that the King James has new revelation, which may be lost in the Hebrew or Greek. Now, those categories are not official, and the terms, they're just terms that I'm using, so I'm not saying that they're like professionally recognised categories. It's just to help you understand the different viewpoints of King James only, because some people will lump it all as belonging to one of those things, when really you may apply some of them, but not all of them. So me being the case in point, what is my position? Well, essentially, I adhere to the first 
three categories, but in reverse order. So most importantly, I reject the manuscripts underlying most modern translations that result in many different readings and the omission of some verses. I also hold that the King James Version is the optimal translation for English speakers, superior to the received text Bibles that came before or after. Now, I do not expect a non-English speaker to learn English. A good Bible translation in their language would be perfectly reasonable. And then finally, I reject the unfounded premise that the King James is somehow re-inspired or superior to the underlying Greek and Hebrew. It is simply just a good translation of the correct text. Although I may specify that I'm King James only because people are familiar with the term, this only really applies to the English language. Taking other languages into consideration, my position is actually textus receptus only. Even if there are modern alternatives to the King James Bible that meet the aforementioned criteria, the King James Bible remains my favourite because I have memorised readings, but also the popularity of the King James gives it many features and options that are not available in modern equivalents. So for example, the choice of Bible formats. So the popularity of the King James means that lots of different options of Bible formats are available that would not be available in other modern translations of the same text, such as note-taking edition, so you have the Journal the Word Bible, for instance, or alternative sizes like large print or pocket-sized Bibles, and also bilingual translation, so the King James Bible can be compared side by side with a non-English language for a non-native speaker. And there's also many online tools available to the King James as well, so it's available on the most helpful and most widely used online reading tools, such as Bible Hub and Bible Gateway. So Bible Hub allows you to compare individual King James verses with other popular English translations and inquire about the underlying Greek and Hebrew, although the Greek and Hebrew references may not be based on the same source text though. And then Bible Gateway allows you to highlight passages and compare two translations in entire chapters side by side. And you can also sometimes compare the King James with non-English versions too. And then the kingsbible.com offers an English-based KJV concordance, so this actually allows you to search for verses based on the English words they contain according to the King James, rather than searching by the Hebrew or the Greek word as you would do on Bible Hub. And interestingly, even some of the most popular versions do not have a website like this. And the King James is also the Bible of choice for many Wikipedia articles as well. It's often used as the base translation to compare the differences between verses in other translations when that applies. And then finally, there's also less copyright issues as well. So outside of the UK and other Commonwealth nations, the King James is usually public domain. So you can pretty much quote it as much as you like, print it as much as you like, and cite it as many times in writings as you like, with no legal implications and no special circumstances or permissions required. Why does this matter? Why is King James onlyism, or Textus Receptus Onlyism, an issue that warrants discussion? Why elevate the King James Bible above any other translation? Well, there are many reasons why it matters, depending on how far down the rabbit trail you want to go, but fundamentally there are two important reasons that largely encompass other subsets of reasons. So firstly, you have how the Bible is translated. So two Bibles may have different readings, even though they are based on the same Greek text due to translation decisions made by the translators. There may be various reasons for this, some of which may be sinister, but not always. And then secondly, you have what the Bible is actually translated from. So you may have heard the phrase, go back to the Greek, to see what the Bible really should say. But the problem with this is that there is more than one Greek. Two Bibles may have different readings because they are based on different source texts, not because either Bible is badly translated. So how are Bibles translated? Well, because Hebrew and Greek are different languages with their own grammatical rules, there is no way to exactly translate like for like in English. If you tried to translate word for word, it would be nonsensical in English, as you can see for yourself if you try to read an interlinear Bible. It just really wouldn't make any sense. You have to adjust the sentences to meet the grammatical requirements of English. This may include translating the same word into English words across multiple verses, and it may also include using new words in English not featured in the original language. Sometimes two different translations or answers are not necessarily wrong, they're just different for their own reasons. So for example, let's look at 2 Timothy 2.15, which you can see on the screen there. The word underlying study in our King James, or do your best in the English Standard Version, means make every effort or be diligent. So the English Standard Version is perhaps more literal, but the King James is more contextually appropriate and instructionally practical, given how the author employs the word in the sentence. 
The word underlying dividing in the King James or handling in the ESV is an unusual and uncommon word meaning to cut straight or to dissect correctly. So the King James is more literal and some people may find it more practical than the English standard, although the English standard is more suited to contemporary English speakers. And then you have what's called semantic equivalence. So some translations use a more formal equivalent approach to translate the Bible more accurately or literally to the underlying language such as directly translating the ancient idioms that we see in the Bible. Whereas other translations may use a more dynamic equivalent approach, translating the Bible so it is easier to comprehend in the target language, such as completely rewording an ancient idiom into a statement or figure of speech that is more intelligible to speakers of the target language. Most translations will use a combination of both approaches. You may also find that translations take a formal equivalent approach generally, however they use an idiom in the target language which makes it seem like a dynamic equivalent in some specific verses. So for example if we take Matthew 27 44 where our King James says cast the same in his teeth, well there is no underlying Greek for casting or teeth in this verse. Reviling him would be a more literal translation, however in English, at least at the time that the King James was translated, cast the same in his teeth was an idiom for berating. So even though the King James looks like it's translating an idiom, it isn't. But the idiom is suited to the target language, so if the target reader understands the idiom, then by interpreting the idiom they do effectively get a correct translation anyway, so arguably it is still a translation rather than an interpretation. If we take another example, Job 3.8, so the King James says, raise up their mourning, whereas the English Standard Version says, rouse up Leviathan. Well, the English Standard is a direct translation of what is arguably an idiom. The King James, as well as some other Bibles from around or before its time, translate the idiom into its presumed meaning. So, for example, in English, this would be a bit like if you translated the phrase the elephant in the room from English to another language, you might instead translate that as the big issue nobody wants to discuss, because the target language speakers may not know what the idiom elephant in the room means, and they may get very confused if they interpret that literally. So translating an idiom to a non-idiom is a more difficult decision to make, perhaps because you would have to rely on the translators knowing with authority what the idiom means. But on the other hand, the idiom may be utterly confusing to the target audience if translated correctly. The issue of how Bibles are translated can spill over into gospel-related issues, whereby it could be said that a translation is intentionally promoting works-based salvation, which I have talked about before, for example, in my Repentance in a Nutshell series. So if we take James 2.24, the King James says, justified by works and faith. In the New International Version, it actually says that a person is considered righteous by faith and what they do. So the New International Version replaces the word justified in James 2 with considered righteous. This is in direct contradiction to Romans 4, which explicitly states that righteousness is justified without works. The context of James 2, profiting and loving the brethren, dictates what it means in our King James to be justified by works, just as righteousness is the context in Romans 4 whereby we are justified without works. The New International Version here has made righteousness the context of justification directly in James 2, blatantly teaching work salvation and completely contradicting Romans 4. So what are Bibles translated from? Well, there are lots of manuscripts, which essentially that word means a handwritten copy of the Bible or parts of the Bible, each with variants and you also get different text types, which are kind of like families of manuscripts, which results in completely different readings or even the absence or addition of certain verses or parts of verses. So, for example, if we take Acts 8.37, this verse exists in our King James Bible, but it does not exist in the English Standard Version. And the reason is that the King James Bible uses manuscripts which contain Acts 8.37, while the English Standard uses manuscripts which do not contain Acts 8.37. And so, the English Standard Version just simply does not contain this verse. Now, some translations, such as the New International Version, may relegate these verses or their alternative readings to footnotes rather than including them in the main body of the text. Or for more extensive but questionable passages, they may italicise the font. Now, you may be wondering, why do we have different families of manuscripts? Well, perhaps you've heard of the Byzantine text type or the Alexandrian text type. What does all that really mean? 
The problem with this question is that a lot of people think of their modern Bible as a leather-bound book that's joined at the spine from Genesis all the way to Revelation, and if you buy 10,000 copies of the Bible, every single one of them will see the exact same thing. But then people will apply that to ancient copying and preservation of manuscripts. But the thing is, prior to the printing press, the Bible actually had to be copied by hand. And so it couldn't be copied in the way that you would just print another book. Full copies of the Bible had to be handwritten. Consequently, they were rare and very expensive. Ordinary people couldn't afford them. And they were so valuable that churches chained them to pulpits to prevent them from being stolen. Texts may have been preserved as scrolls or loose collections of paper or much smaller books. In such a format, they would not contain the entire Bible or even an entire book of the Bible. So some parts of the Bible, such as the Gospel of John, are much better preserved and far more abundant than other parts of the Bible, such as the Book of Revelation. Manuscripts also degrade. They don't keep very well, so are usually fragmented and damaged by the time we discover them and they continue to degrade while in possession, so they do not preserve the entirety of their contents. Because manuscripts are essentially handwritten copies of the Bible, scribes are prone to making mistakes, or taking it upon themselves to correct perceived mistakes. Because of this, most, if not all, manuscripts will contain discrepancies, whereby they don't perfectly agree with each other, with the odd word or verse containing differences or variants. So in this regard, virtually every manuscript is unique. If you have a collection of manuscripts, you can gradually identify these discrepancies in an attempt to correct all mistakes. So it's rather like having 20 copies of a newspaper and you identify a mistake in one of them. However, to complicate the matter, the Bible was also copied in various geographically independent locations. As a result, we have different text types based on those locations whereby manuscripts are broadly grouped into families. Although manuscripts each contain variants and discrepancies, broadly speaking, the manuscripts within the same family agree with each other when you eliminate these mistakes and discrepancies. But the discrepancies between the different text types is far greater because manuscripts may have completely different readings that significantly change particular verses. So the New Testament essentially may be translated into English from one or more of these families. So you have the Byzantine text type, and this is also called the majority text. And so this is the main source of the Greek New Testament. Most manuscripts available are in this family, as it has been continuously used in the Greek-speaking world, particularly Byzantium throughout the centuries, hence why it is called the majority text. That's where the majority of the evidence is, or the Byzantine text. It emerged around Byzantium. Even though the majority of manuscripts align with this text type, they are not the oldest manuscripts available. The Textus Receptus, or the Received Text, is basically a compilation of the majority text, and it's based on the Byzantine text, but does have some differences from the majority text. So, for example, most Greek manuscripts do not contain 1 John 5, 7, but the Textus Receptus does. And then you have the Alexandrian text type. So these are Greek manuscripts that were used in and around Alexandria, Egypt. While manuscripts were known and kept in monastic or Catholic libraries, the text was largely largely unknown or unavailable to most scribes anyway for several centuries, and it was not used for translating the New Testament until the manuscripts were rediscovered or otherwise made available in the 19th century. So Reformation-era Bibles did not consult them. Modern Bibles now consult the Alexandrian text alongside the Byzantine text, and the critical text, which a bit like the Textus Receptus is a compilation, is based on an eclectic use of the Alexandrian text. And then you have the Western text type. So these were Greek manuscripts used in and around the Western Roman Empire, where Latin was the lingua franca. And this text employs frequent paraphrasing and expands on the narrative, so it's much longer than the Alexandrian text. Um, some old Latin manuscripts before Jerome's translation and Syriac translations may align with this text type. But Jerome's Latin translation moved away from using the Western text, and so his Latin translation displaced old Latin translations. As with the Alexandrian text type, some very early manuscripts are available, but evidence is not very abundant. And although conventional wisdom suggests that the New Testament would be exclusively translated from Greek sources, the issue of textual preservation and issues with the Greek does warrant that sometimes non-Greek sources may also be consulted, particularly Latin manuscripts. So here's a couple of examples to show you how different Greek sources will give you different readings. So if we take John 5.4 in the Byzantine text, this is not found in the Alexandrian text, so the King James Bible includes this verse, whereas the English Standard omits it. 
In Matthew 5.22, we have a slightly longer reading in the King James because it says, Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger. Whereas in the English Standard Version, there is no without a cause. It's just the anger alone that triggers the judgment. So that's the New Testament. What about the Old Testament? Well, the Old Testament differs from the New Testament in that its two main text types are actually in different languages. So we have the Masoretic text, and this is Hebrew and partially Aramaic, preservation of the scriptures, but with added modernized diacritic markings representing the vowels, which were not present in the Old Testament originally, because the written language originally only contained consonants. And then you have the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament, which in some cases has very different readings. The Septuagint also contains additional books beyond the Jewish canon, which are considered deuterocanonical or apocryphal, and they may be included in the Catholic or Orthodox Bibles, but not most Protestant Bibles. So to give you an example of the differences between the two, so in Job 1.6, the Masoretic text says sons of God, whereas the Septuagint says the angels. Although it doesn't affect major doctrine, the concept of angels being known as sons of God or vice versa creates a potential doctrinal conflict with Hebrews 1.5. The New International Version is actually in a minority of Bibles which use the Septuagint as the source of this verse. Some translations do use the Septuagint but use more ambiguous language such as heavenly beings. And then you also have the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls revealed that there were multiple versions of the Hebrew scriptures, as there are the Greek scriptures. And although they agree more with the Masoretic text, they are somewhat in between that and the Septuagint. So even around the time of the Apostles and Jesus, there were conflicting texts in circulation. When we use a printed Bible, while mistakes could potentially exist in these, if there was an error with the way the printing press was set up, it's easy to assume that there's only one Bible. Every copy is exactly the same, every verse reads exactly the same, so it's an easy mistake to just assume then that that's how it would have been for those ancient Bibles, but that wasn't the case. When you discover then that these different manuscripts read differently, you have to delve into this further to realise there are lots of different backgrounds and readings and reasons behind all of this that go beyond just a simple translation decision. It's very easy to make oversimplified statements like just go back to the originals. You'll often hear this thrown around, original text, what do the originals say? Original this and original that. The fundamental problem with this is that we do not have the original text. No manuscript in existence that we know of is regarded as the original piece of paper that the original author wrote. If we had this information, this issue would not even be a controversy. The controversy exists and these conflicts arise because there are no original manuscripts we can consult. Everything we have available, however earlier source is dated, is a copy of a copy of a copy, and so on. You might wonder then if there are all these manuscripts with different readings and unique characteristics and different families of texts, how can we really have a definitive Bible in our hands? Who is deciding what should and shouldn't go in here? Most Bible translators do not collect mountains of manuscripts and then start scrambling through them all frantically trying to figure out what the correct text should be. It would not be possible to gather them all, especially for every committee of every translation, and this is a largely unfeasible task. So this will hopefully give you a visual illustration of how messy this subject is. The original author would have wrote his letter and there would probably be multiple copies of this letter sent out. So there isn't even one original, really. There's multiple originals. And so if the scribe that wrote them wasn't the person who said them, there may even be discrepancies in the originals. And then as the Bible is copied and copied again by various people in various locations, they basically copy from whatever manuscripts are available to them in their time and place. And this is just a visual illustration, but the red question mark illustrates that there is no evidence of a manuscript's existence. So there is no evidence of the original copies. There is almost no evidence of the copies made a few decades or centuries after those. And they're probably not direct copies anyway. They're probably still copies of copies. And the evidence is fragmented at best with the orange exclamation mark visually indicating a heavily damaged manuscript. And then as time progresses, more and more manuscriptural evidence becomes available and with less fragmentations, but they are dated later and later from the originals. And you can see how some manuscripts would have been lost with no surviving copies of them made, their lines did not continue, 
other manuscripts continued and then new manuscripts consulted multiple conflicting manuscripts from before them and finally you can see in pink where families of text or text types have become distinguishable from one another where the lines of textual continuation differ so like your Byzantine text and your Alexandrian text but then you can also end up with eclectic texts that have taken sources from both as their underlying source material. So then round about the time that the printing press starts to become a thing, a scholar named Erasmus would take a collection of manuscripts that he had available to him, and he would compile them into a definitive single book, a little bit like our King James Bible, but in the Greek. And so this was his New Testament Greek book, and you can apply the same principle to compiling an Old Testament book to work from. So you just take a collection of manuscripts, you piece together what you think should be the correct reading, and then you build a definitive single book. And then later scholars such as Stephanus and Theodore Beza, who you can see on the screen, that is a picture of Beza, it's not John Calvin. These men would then add to Erasmus's work. Erasmus himself also made improvements on his own work, and so they would collect more manuscripts and they would revise their editions and make later revised editions of their work. So this is where we get the textus receptus from, essentially. So then Bible translation committees will pick a handful of these compiled works to inform the basis of text for their Bible translation. And they may also consult previous translation works and secular information, not necessarily to decide what to translate, but to inform them how to translate. So for example, they could look at various Greek literature to understand how certain words or phrases were used, or they could use a concordance, and they could look at how previous Bible translation committees understood certain Greek or Hebrew obscurities. And the final result then after they've made a translation is that you have a, a single source of truth as your final Bible. However, because there are multiple committees using a variety of sources and each translation committee will revise their own work, we inevitably get different and conflicting translations of the Bible. So we only really have a single source of truth if we are all using the exact same translation. So a big reason we have these differences between different Bibles saying different things is because of the difficulty in reconciling this information and making a final decision, and because different lines of manuscripts have diverged in readings and there are different philosophies and critical principles used at different times. So during the Reformation period, the anti-Catholic sentiment at the time drove the philosophy of looking back at the original languages and so they would prefer the Greek over the Latin or the Hebrew over the Greek and Latin for their Old Testament. Fast forward to the 19th century, following two scholars named Westcott and Hort, most Bibles today take a preference for the oldest manuscripts available, and so they drift towards the Septuagint and the Alexandrian text, but they do take an eclectic approach, so they will consider both families. And just like me, as a King James Onlyist, I am at risk of my own prejudices. Scholars and translators may also be bound to their prejudices as well. So there's a lot more that could be said on that, but this is just an introduction. So in specific videos, I can delve into more specifics as I add to this series as the months go by. Uh, but for now, it's a wrap. So I hope you found that helpful. Um, please do leave your feedback in the comments.